Hey everyone, Pastor Caleb here with another episode of Criticisms of Lutheranism. It's a chance for us to walk through what some people would criticize about our position on the scriptures and hopefully by studying the scriptures together, at least create some common ground and maybe find a nuanced answer to these questions rather than as Lutherans looking at everybody else and saying, you're all wrong because you're not Lutheran. And as those looking at Lutheranism say, you're all wrong because you're Lutheran and maybe find some uh, unity over the scriptures. We might not come to an agreement, but my hope is that through this, we are all growing in our understanding of what the Bible says and hopefully learning to love each other, uh, even as sin divides us by doctrine, by culture, by practice, by all these things, um, which is the unfortunate nature of the church militant. But when we get to be the church triumphant in heaven someday, we will have all these distinctions gone um, because sin will no longer cloud our judgment or our understanding of God. But until then, we still sojourn here. So I'm excited that you're here with me to study uh, another section of God's word that talks about men and women. That's the topic we're taking on right now. We're going to go to 1 Timothy 2 today. This is just a fantastic text. It's got some really interesting textual notes to it, and then I think also some really good pastoral application that we can make at the end. So I'm going to read the text, uh, and then I'll, and I'll put it on the screen for you, and then hopefully we'll work through it verse by verse after that. All right, so 1 Timothy 2, we're starting at verse 8. It says, Therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. I also want the women to dress modestly, with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds, appropriate for women who profess to worship God. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived, it was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Okay, so this is God's word. Uh, the first verse, verse 8, says, I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger and disputing. Um, so first of all, we have to be careful. This verse is not saying that we have to pray with our like hands raised or anything like that. The idea of lifting your hand is the idea of taking your hand from um, like a static state, like when you're you know, normally just standing, your hands are at your side. Uh, to lift your hand is to do anything with your hand. So I can lift my hand to scratch my nose. I could lift my hand to throw a rock. I could lift my hand to fight with somebody, or I could lift my hands to pray. I'm just doing something. Instead of doing things that are anger and quarreling, uh, Paul says to Timothy, what I want you to teach the men to do is to pray first and foremost. And then he contrasts this with what he says about women. He says, I also want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles, gold pearls, expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. So he says, women, uh, that I want you to make sure that your beauty is not in everything external, but in the internal heart that you have for the gospel and for the good deeds that the gospel produces. And what, what Paul is doing here right at the beginning is he's say, is saying very obviously there is just a distinction between men and women. And that distinction, he says, is in their actions and in their tendency to sin. Which is kind of an interesting thing. I think we, I mean, we're going to come up against this again and again in this text, but we want to think that men and women are the same and they struggle with the same things or whatever. Um, but first of all, social science is just demolishing that idea. And the Bible very clearly says that that's not true. Um, Paul says, look, if you're looking at men in the church, their tendency is to try to gain power. They're going to do that by fighting against each other. They're going to try to find their worth in their actions. Of course, it's not every man, but in general, men tend to define themselves by their actions. I mean, if you're a man right now, I would challenge you. Do you think about your self-worth more in the things that you do or in something else? I mean, for me, at least personally, I am most emotionally broken up by the things that I do or don't do, like how I'm performing at my job or how I'm performing as a father or I'm performing as a mother, uh, as a, a husband, um, all these things, like how am I performing? What am I doing? That's the stuff that I value. And that's a good thing. God, like, built that into men. On the other hand, uh, women tend to view themselves and their self-worth in what other people think of them and not so much in what they do. Now, of course, not every woman again, but in general, women are more concerned with relationships, right? So rather than what they do, they're more concerned with what do other people think of me? And part of what other people think of me is how I look, right? Which obviously the Apostle Paul is going after here. So there's a distinction between men and women. Paul's just saying that's generally how it is. And these are the things that generally people fall into. So Timothy, as a pastor, teach your men and women these things. Then he says, 
A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not te- permit a woman to teach or assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. Okay, so there are a number of pieces we need to pull out of this verse. First of all, we just need to talk about some of the things that um, sco- some scholars will say are like textual variants or um, ways that you can understand the text that are a little bit different than this English translation. I'm using the New International Version um, because I think it's a pretty widely accepted English translation, but I want to bring some of these out for you. Um, the first one is that wherever the word woman or man is used in these verses, some would say you could substitute the terms husband and wife. And that's not wrong. Um, that is part of the way the Greek words aner and um, I can't remember the word for woman uh, or wife uh, off the top of my head, but aner is the word for man. You can understand it that way. Uh, man and woman could also be husband and wife, of course. And then the assumption would be then these things are not applicable to the church. They're just applicable to the home. Okay, well, I I would contend with that, that this is, first of all, a pastoral letter. So the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy as he is talking about his congregation. And this, um, this whole section is about how the church is supposed to exist together, right? So this is not a section about the home. It is a section about the church. So I would lean to what the translation has here, which is women and men in general. This is about them. Um, Another portion of this is the word authority. Um, Sometimes people will say, well, that word authority is sort of a rare word in Greek. And that's true. It's a word that doesn't show up very often. And because of that, we don't have a lot of um, other contexts in which we can see the word being used in order to know exactly what it means. Um, Now, the word, of course, is... Uh, is translated authority, and that's our best, you know, understanding of this word. Um, but I think what makes this a little bit easier to understand is a Greek construction called a hendiadis. Uh, you don't need to know what hendiadis means. It, it just is literally translated one in two. Um, and the idea is that you would take two words that are mutually descriptive. Uh, so we actually do this in English if we um, have like, uh, you know, a baby in a crib, and we would say, oh, the baby looks so nice and cozy. Uh, we, we are saying, of course, that the baby is, yes, looks very cozy, snuggly, but we you're not also saying that he has a good personality and that's really easy to get along with. Um, We're using these two words to describe each other uh, two in one, right? Two words to describe one state of being. And I think that's what's happening in this text. Now, obviously, I am not as high level of a Greek scholar as a lot of people are, but I think it's an easy way in a normal Greek construction to understand what the plain meaning of the text says. So if we can understand that teaching and authority are two things that are connected, I think we'll understand this verse a little bit better. So he says, I do not permit a woman to have, uh, to teach or to assume authority over a man because she is learning in quietness and full submission. So the teaching and learning words are the first things to notice here. This is in the context of the public worship gathering, which if you remember from where we were in 1 Corinthians 11 through 14, was a unique gathering, something that's different than what we have in our public worship gatherings today. You would have probably an itinerant preacher coming around and you'd have a group of people who were to sort of evaluate that guy's preaching and say, okay, is what he is saying true? I think it's also worth mentioning that at this time, you know, the Bible is very clear that women were prophesying as well. So women have the ability to speak God's word and speak it in such a way that it is instructive for other people. Um, but there is an understanding that in the public worship gathering, the role of evaluating the preaching and having the authority to say this lines up with God's word or does not line up with God's word is a role that is reserved for men. So in that teaching and learning relationship that happens on Sunday morning, the teaching is supposed to happen through the man and the learning is supposed to happen through a woman. And that doesn't mean that she's not able to speak at other times, but in this relationship, the teaching relationship of the public ministry, that is a role that is reserved not for women. Um, And then, so if we understand that and assuming authority imported into that idea of teaching, um, then it gives us a little bit more leeway into what we can say exactly is authority in the congregation. Now, the tough thing for us in this is that because this word is not super specific, um, churches have different ways of applying this idea of authority. And I think just by like meditating on this for a second, you can sort of understand why. Like think of the word authority. That word means different things to different people right? Even that concept of authority means different things to different people. Is it authority if my wife just decides what we're going to buy at the grocery store? Is that authority? 
or did I give her that right or that uh, that job in our household or did she ask for that job in our household or did that just happen to work out because of the way our schedules are or is that something she's more interested in than me? I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that go into deciding whether that's an authoritative position or not. And so much of it is specific to the group of people who is gathering together. Now, I'm not saying that every congregation can just go and describe authority however they want to, but I am saying that you have to be careful not to draw a line in the sand where God has not drawn a line in the sand. Now, what we have done as a church body, and the reason we draw our lines in the sand where we do, is we have come together as all the congregations of our church body and said, this is where we're going to draw the line just for the sake of walking together in unity. Can you make a biblical case that, for example, um, a woman could be on a leadership team or a church council? I think he probably could. I don't think that is an airtight argument that women are not allowed in that that position uh, role in the congregation because I don't always think that's a teaching position. But I think you could also make a pretty good argument that there is a certain level of spiritual authority that is afforded to your church council. And maybe the way that your church council or your leadership team or whatever, the way it's formed, it doesn't have spiritual authority or it does have more spiritual authority. Maybe, for example, if your leadership team just deals with like, business decisions for your congregation. That's maybe not a spiritual authority position, but what if like our leadership team at my congregation, our leadership team is not just responsible for the business decisions, but it's also responsible for elder care. So like looking after our members and making sure they you know they're coming to church and they, they know what's going on in the congregation. Those are Those are positions of spiritual care. So maybe we would say, well, in that situation, we wouldn't want a woman. But again, all of this is so squishy. And and that leads us to this conclusion, which I think is very important. So if you haven't been paying attention or you lost me somewhere in here, I want you to tune in for this idea. As we think about what authority looks like in the church, first of all, we remember what God said in 1 Corinthians, which is that all of this ought to be done in love. And then secondly, that we ought to sacrifice for the sake of everyone else. And this is my first pastoral application of this. Um, it's really easy when it comes to the roles of men and women to try to figure out how much ground can I gain for myself, right? If you're a woman, how many things can I do? If you're a man, how many ways can I maybe limit women? And, and the idea here being that I want for myself. And, and God says that is not how his economy works. In every situation, a Christian ought to look to sacrifice for the sake of everyone else. I want to give up a power. I want to give up power. I want to give up uh, my ability to, to work for my own good for the sake of you so that you can do more, so that you can flourish, so that you can benefit and be blessed by these things. And so we always want to have that attitude. So for example, maybe I can make a really good biblical argument. I'm just saying hypothetically for a woman being on a leadership team. But if I have members of my congregation who are really uncomfortable with that, and um, and they have a pretty solid biblical an- like idea of why they're uncomfortable with that, not just, I don't like it because it's not the way we've always done things. That's a bad argument. But if they are looking at scripture, like, prayerfully, thoughtfully, and saying like, look at pastor, I'm looking at these verses and I'm really convicted by them, man, like my heart is going to go out to them and want to work with them and be patient with them and not force my idea of what authority looks like on those people. The idea here is not to be social justice warriors in the church. We are not here to try to change everything to fit with our culture. We are here to come back to scripture and let scripture inform us and then use scripture to love each other in our different roles that God has given us as men and women. Okay, so let's get back to the text. Uh, Look at verse 13. It says, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. So he goes back to creation, which by the way, this is something Paul does time and time again. He just says, look, go back to the nature of things. Go back to the nature of things. Go back to the nature of things. God created male and female. He made them different. He made them for different roles. That is just the way that God created it. Um, And this is really important because sometimes there's an argument against the apostle Paul that, oh, he was just a product of his culture. And because he was part of a misogynistic patriarchal culture that he just forced this idea on the church. No, Paul says, look, I'm going back thousands of years back to when the creation happened and God created the male and female. This isn't about me being Roman or me being first century Jewish or anything like that. This is about what God has said eternally from creation about humanity. Okay. Then verse 14, he says, Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. 
Okay, um, and so his point here is to help us understand that there's two ways that Adam and Eve both sinned. And uh, first of all, you have Adam, which is implied. He doesn't talk about it here, but he does talk about it in other places like Romans 5, where he says Adam's sin was not exercising his authority over his wife in the correct way. In fact, he just passively gave up his authority, which is a sin against what God has called men to do. And as a result, um, Eve was deceived, right? Uh, she was the one who was actually in that moment given the authority to decide whether what the ser serpent was saying was right or wrong. And because she was put in that position that God had not called her to, she was not equipped for it and she was deceived. Um, and this is not to say that women are like inferior in their... Um, their ability to resist sin or anything like that. But what, what God is saying is, look, this, this breakdown of this, this hierarchy that I have created, this system where, you know, every uh, woman is, a uh, man is the head of woman and Christ is the head of man and God is the head of Christ. Like that system that he has put in place, any breakdown is going to lead to sin just like it did back at the beginning when God created the male and female. His point here is just to say like, this is not just like a thing that I want you to do because I just want everything to be neat and tidy and clean in your congregation, but this is actually really important for human flourishing and fits in with God's law. And then the last thing he says, verse 15, but women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Okay, so obviously this verse is enigmatic and a lot of people have questions about this. Um, and I've done a lot of study on this. I've really tried to figure out what this verse says. And I've, I've come to two, I think, conclusions. Um, and, and both of them, I think, have really good merit. I'm not absolutely convinced of either of them, although I do lean to one way, but I'll give you both of them and I think they're both really helpful. Um, the first of those would be that this idea of being saved through childbearing is the idea that a woman will be uh, living out her vocation uh, it, and when she lives out her vocation, she will be doing what God has what called her to, right? She, she lives as a woman because she is a woman. She does womanly things. She lives out that role. She will be living in line with God's word, right? And because childbearing is a very unique thing that a woman can do and a man can't do, God says that thing, that is sort of like one that describes everything else that it is to be a woman, one thing that describes everything else. So in, in like, uh, maybe like you think of part for the whole, right? Um, uh, we maybe like we do this with government, right? We'll say like, um, you know, Ottawa decided or something like this. We'll use like a word that describes a whole group of things. So he says childbearing. This is descriptive of what it means to be a woman, although there are a whole bunch of other things that fit under that umbrella. If you are living your vocation as woman, you will be living in line with God's word. And that's a really good thing. That's the one I kind of lean towards. But I heard another one that I think is really helpful. And um, at least gives us an alternative option. And that is that the word saved here um, may not mean saved in the sense of living in line with God's word and, and the gospel that has saved a person. But that the idea would be that if you have these two roles of men and women, and in the context, you know, men are using their authority in anger and quarreling to get power, and and um, and women are different than that, that the result might be in a congregation, women will be kind of, um, well, second-class citizens, downtrodden, under the authority of men who are sinful. And that this idea of saved is that uh, they will be brought up to equal value because God has given them in their vocation, which already is equal value, but then is acted out in childbearing, which is the I would say the most valuable thing that human beings do on earth. And I don't think I'm overstating that case. Like bringing life into the world is the most important thing human beings do on earth. And that is done, I mean, primarily the man participates, but primarily through a woman. And so she, by the value of the thing that God has uniquely given to her, will show her value in the congregation um, by her childbearing. I think it's a pretty good argument. Um, I, I was, I suppose, a little bit famous when I was teaching um, before my call here to cross of life um, when, uh, when I would say uh, women mothers make more Christians than pastors. Uh, and I, I really believe that that's true. I mean, think of how many Christians are just those who are born and baptized and brought up in the faith versus how many, you know, pastors are actually converting people into the faith as adults. I would say more women. First of all, there's just more mothers than there are pastors in the world. And so they just have a head start in just sheer numbers. Um, but then, you know, that work tends to be really influential. Um, as a pastor, I run into a lot of people who are not believers and very few of them convert to Christianity because that's just what the Bible says is going to happen. But when you can when you can grow a child up from their baptism in the word of God, which many Christian mothers do, which is awesome, you are making more Christians 
And this just plays out practically. Like one of the big reasons that North American Christianity is going down in numbers is yes, because some people are leaving the church, of course. But the biggest reason I think is that Christians are just having less babies. We used to have lots of babies. And now because of birth control and abortion and the idea of like, you know, you have to have two incomes. And so parents don't feel that they can manage having more than one, two kids in the house. Like all those things have led to us having fewer babies, which is unfortunate because the Bible says that babies are a blessing from God. Um, and our oftentimes our greed or our, feel, our, our need to feel like we're doing something that the world values rather than what God values, um, it's going to lead us to those things. So what God says is, if you're a woman, love the role that I've given you, the very beautiful role of being the child bearer for the sake of the church and, and, um, and obviously for the world. Now, there are some pastoral applications I want to give, and I know this is uh, going a little bit long, but I just want us to think about it in this way. Um, what the world wants us to do is to constantly try to get power and get influence. Um, in fact, if you were to go online and look up, you know, the, the definition of like submission, for example, which is a, t a word that's in this text, you would find that it is the idea of being like dominated or inferior to somebody. Um, that is a North American way of thinking of submission because North Americans think being in a higher position means I am more valuable, I have more power, therefore I am better. That is a North American way of thinking. That is not a Christian way of thinking. The Christian way of thinking is that the gospel says, when I am doing nothing, that is when I am most blessed. When God is doing everything for me, that is when I am most blessed. It is very specifically said in the scripture multiple times, the first shall be last and the last shall be first, right? Those who are doing nothing, who have nothing to offer, those are the ones who receive the kingdom of heaven. And that is just like a foundational idea for Christianity in general. And so just apply this to men and women for a second. This is not the teaching, but if this was the teaching that God said, women, you can't do anything like let's just like play on the little motif of the 1945, you know, North American, like woman chained to the kitchen in bare feet and barren babies all the time. Like that idea, like what if that was actually what God said? Wouldn't that be blessed? That God said, you don't have to do anything, women. Just sit back and relax and enjoy that God is providing for you and, and your, your husband or the men of your society are providing for you. Wouldn't that be blessed? The very fact that we rail against that thought shows how North American, frankly, sinful culture has, has just ransacked the Christian idea of men and women. And the same for men. Like, obviously, God gave this authority role to men, but men are always trying to get more power. And I know I'm, I'm guilty of this. I don't want other people to take my influence or my power in whatever situation I'm in. That's my temptation and I got to fight against that. I need to realize time and time again, the gospel says when I am doing nothing, when I think nothing of myself, but God thinks highly of me through Jesus Christ, that is when I am most blessed. That is when I am saved. So if we can always have that thought in the back of our mind, that if I can in any way step back and let others receive the blessings of God, or in another way, step up in order to sacrifice myself for the sake of others, because that's what Jesus did for me, then we will all be blessed. This is a long video, and so I'm cutting it off here, but keep watching this series because we're walking through these texts in the hope of finally getting to a place where we can empathetically answer why the Lutheran Church stands where it does on the roles of men and women, and hopefully find some common ground. And if you've been watching this long, I'm thankful that you stuck with me. Make sure you like this video, subscribe, and share it if you think it was beneficial. I'll talk to you next time.